Hello everyone from the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Wessex and today we are once again talking about those Anglo-Saxon invaders, immigrants, we are talking about Anglo-Saxon culture because once again conservatives have gotten very mad that a university has decided that the Anglo-Saxon classification doesn't really make much sense considering the original Anglo-Saxon invaders and migrants weren't just Angles and Saxons and that Anglo-Saxon rule over England was more complicated and also looking back at the historiography of like the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries of people creating an Anglo-Saxon racial identity which is more relevant to American politics and British politics but I want to talk about all of that today. Now, living in the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Wessex, I have changed the scenery for this video, mainly because I was just about to record my video early because I'm going out for someone's birthday today and then people start mowing the lawn. So I got to run downstairs and quickly record it in this room instead. So hashtag YouTubers are the most oppressed. So what I want to do is look at this new like take on Anglo-Saxon history and why I agree with it then look at the conservative backlash and then just like debunk it because I've made a lot of videos on this stuff. I don't want to retread old ground loads, but I will give people a general overview because I'm well aware, even though I've made like four videos on this stuff, a lot of people will be watching this video for the first time and they might be wondering like, you know, I don't even know what Anglo-Saxons are in the first place. So you're going to have to explain it to me. So all of that coming up for you today. But before we go any further, please like the video and in the comments, let me know if you're American, where you taught about Anglo-Saxon history, like, I don't know, Alfred the Great, the Battle of Hastings, the Norman Conquest of Anglo-Saxon, England, let me know. Also, have you heard anyone in your real life refer to themselves as an Anglo-Saxon? Seems to still be quite popular with some elements of the far-right conservative movement in America. Also, follow me on Twitter and follow me on Instagram at the cavernacle and also consider becoming a patron trying to build up as many one to three dollar patrons as possible and benefits include getting access to exclusive content getting access to the private patrons discord server and getting my nintendo switch friend code so if you care about any of that stuff and want to support me go check out the patreon page and also check out the subreddit and check out my second channel down in the description but anglo-saxon history is something like pretty much every english kid is going to learn about mainly in regards to the conquest by the Normans because growing up I did the Battle of Hastings and that was really like my focal point of Anglo-Saxon history as a kid in like high school secondary school and we didn't really learn about like Alfred the Great although London became a part of Wessex I guess if you grow up in like historic Wessex maybe you learn a bit more about it because it's so like integral to the history of those places whereas we just you know learn about the Norman invasion William the Conqueror and I don't know, various different Anglo-Saxon kings leading up to this period. At university, I studied it a bit more, mainly in regards to like Beowulf and Alfred the Great and like his interpretation of Christianity. And recently I've been consuming more like Viking media, like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, uh, the show Vikings. I read a big history book about medieval history. So I've become even more informed about the time period, especially to do with like the Romans actually leaving Britain in the first place. And I do find this whole period like very, very interesting. So I'm basically gonna give you the short version of Anglo-Saxon history first before we're going to get into the new drama because a lot of you Americans probably understand Anglo-Saxon as a way often very racist people identify themselves try and distinguish themselves from other white people basically saying no we're actually better than other white people we come from Anglo-Saxon stock like we're not like those Italians we're not like those Irish people. We're not like those Spaniards. Even myself as a white person, look how pale I look in this video. I've got racist comments on YouTube because I have dark features, especially when I talk about Anglo-Saxon stuff. They always say, well, you're just jealous because you're not an Anglo-Saxon. You're like Mongol, you're Russian. They're a bunch of slurs about Jewish people to me. So, and also before we get started, people often take exception to me describing groups in like the 400s as like English, Irish, Welsh. I know that's not technically accurate, but just for the sake of simplifying everything, I will be referring to these groups like this. But anyway, basically the Romans left Britain in like the fifth century as the Roman Empire was essentially splitting into two, decided that Britain wasn't really worth it anymore. There were still people in England who subscribed to Roman pagan religion. And actually as the continent was becoming more and more Christianized, a lot of the holdouts to Roman pagan religion were actually in England during this period as well, which I found 
really interesting. There's also like English like nobility descended from Roman generals who tried to invade Europe in this time. So it's an interesting time period. But basically as the Romans left, there was like a massive like power vacuum. There was a void. And this period is where the myths about King Arthur come from as well. And there was this like English war chief called Vortigern who was essentially fighting pirates and invaders from Scotland and from Ireland as well. And he basically appealed to the Germanic peoples of Northern Europe saying, can I get some help here? I need to defend my land. I need to defend my territory. And he essentially promised a bunch of Germanic peoples, if they helped him fight off these groups, a bit of land in Essex. And these people were known as the Anglo-Saxons and they comprised of different Germanic groups. They had the Angles, they had the Saxons, they had the Jutes, and they had the Frisians. So four different separate groups of people combined into one word, the Anglo-Saxons. So already you're kind of seeing this doesn't seem like a very accurate description of four distinct groups, all related and had their similarities, but they were distinct. So they came over, they helped Vortigern and the English fight off different elements from Ireland and different elements from Scotland. And basically Vortigern rewarded them with the land, but then they liked it so much, basically loads of their relatives and just general peoples came from the territories they lived in, in continental Europe, they came over and they actually started conquering the whole of England. And eventually what that led to was the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, you know, in like contemporary pop culture, like Vikings or the last kingdom, like Wessex, Mercia, Northumbria. And obviously even these were distinct entities in that they would often fight each other, but they were united by some sort of like common lineage back to the Germanic invaders from the 400s. But obviously Anglo-Saxons were invading a country which had already been invaded before by the Romans and also had a native population as well, which existed before the Romans. So they're entering into that melting pot. And yes, once they entered into that melting pot, they started mingling with the local population, getting married to local women who could have been Romans. That means they could have been from a whole variety of places across Europe. And of course they could have been a native Briton as well. So they're already mixing in to this melting pot, which was like, 6th, 7th century England. Lots of people love this period as well because you have the Viking invasions. You have the original Viking attacks and then, then Viking conquest of like Northumbria. Of course, York became like the Viking capital known as Jorvik. And in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, they actually did a good job with their discovery mode, which is like an educational mode, just showing you about how the cultures mesh together. Like a lot of Vikings added Jesus Christ to their pantheon of gods. And a lot of Anglo-Saxons added like four to their religion as well. It's a really interesting time period. But it just shows you that the very loose Anglo-Saxon identity was chipped away by so much of his settlement. And then over time, you had various wars between the Anglo-Saxons and Scandinavians until eventually England was actually completely owned by a Scandinavian monarch. You had even more like immigration, settlement by Scandinavians already like you're seeing. Even the Anglo-Saxons were one like very distinct group of people. Their complete identity from the early period wouldn't have survived. And even Anglo-Saxon English identity wouldn't have survived completely intact. And then because you had this Scandinavian king, when England was once again under Saxon administration, when a king called Edward the Confessor died without a child, it led to basically like a war over the throne of England between various different Christian groups, Scandinavians, Normans, who were also from Scandinavian descent, and the Anglo-Saxons culminating in the Battle of Hastings, which was won by the Normans under William the Conqueror. And then England was conquered by the Normans. And then Normans basically completely changed the face of England, right? That's in 1066, ending in about 1070, right? Anglo-Saxon England is dead at this point, 1070. But you have people in America in 2023 saying they are from Anglo-Saxon descent, Anglo-Saxon stock, when it would be extremely hard for them to even know if they are descended from Anglo-Saxons, and even if they have some Anglo-Saxon lineage at all, it's probably not exclusively Anglo-Saxon because of the melting pot, which was England, from like the whole time the Saxons were actually there to the time their basically rule of England was ended by the Normans, right? So already you're seeing, as I tell you the history of this period, creating a racial identity on a bunch of settlers from, from like the sixth century who were already like different groups of people who then mixed into a country which was already diverse, who then existed in a time of history where England was constantly invaded by outside forces, culminating in actually the Saxon rule being ended. You see how ridiculous it is to say you are like Anglo-Saxon, but also you see how the term Anglo-Saxon is quite flawed in itself because we can all recognize there were like Northern Germanic invaders but even this term Anglo-Saxon seems to not make any sense. 
And, you know, historians have been saying this for a long, long time, and that's what this whole controversy stems from. So it was this article by the Tory Graph uh, which spurred the controversy. And we're going to talk about the article, and then we're going to talk about, like, some debunking of it and looking at the reaction. So, uh, Anglo-Saxons aren't real, Cambridge tells students in effort to fight nationalism. Cambridge teaches students that Anglo-Saxons did not exist as a distinct ethnic group as part of their efforts to undermine myths of nationalism. Sounds pretty good. Britain's early medieval history is taught by the Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse, and Celtic, but the terms within its own title are being addressed as a part of efforts to make teaching more anti-racist. Its teaching aims to dismantle the basis of myths of nationalism by explaining that the Anglo-Saxons were not a distinct ethnic group, according to information from the department. The department's approach also aims to show that there were never coherent Scottish, Irish, Welsh ethnic identities with ancient roots. The increased focus on anti-racism comes amid a broader debate over the continued use of terms like Anglo-Saxon, with some in academia alleging that the ethnonym is used to support racist ideas of a native English identity. One lecture addressed how the modern use of the term Anglo-Saxon has been embroiled in indigenous race politics by questioning the extent of the settlement by a distinct ethnic group that could be called Anglo-Saxon. So given some counter, it says, while some have argued a single term like Anglo-Saxon is inaccurate as the Dark Ages were a period of population change, Others, such as Professor Howard William at the University of Chester, maintain that the term remains useful historically and archaeologically. A statement signed by more than 70 academics in 2020 argued that the furore over the term Anglo-Saxon was an American import, with an open letter stating the conditions in which the term is encountered and how it's perceived are very different in the US from elsewhere. In the UK, the period has been carefully presented and discussed in popular and successful documentaries and exhibitions over the years. The term Anglo-Saxon is historically authentic in the sense that from the 8th century, it was used externally to refer to a dominant population in southern Britain. Its earliest uses, therefore, embody exactly the significant issues we can expect any general ethnic or national label to represent. So my thoughts on it is it's good to teach history in this way, that like nationality is constructed. It is a construction. It's not anything inherent. Anglo-Saxon as a term doesn't really make sense. I will admit those other professors who signed that letter saying it's like an American thing. I will admit that Anglo-Saxon as a racial identity is more of an American thing. And it's more of a thing in American politics. America being like the inspiration for so much of European fascism is funny because the founding fathers literally took like ancient Sparta and Anglo-Saxon Britain as like the blueprints for their like new society. It's really bizarre reading about like Thomas Jefferson saying this stuff. But also the thing is Anglo-Saxon racial identity also comes from the UK as well. So I don't think it's wrong to teach history in this way, but I understand that this sort of myth debunking isn't as relevant in the UK. But anyway, a lot of people didn't take this very well and kind of proved the point for them changing it in the first place. So let's have a look at some of the comments I've been reading. Someone posting a meme, the first step in liquidating a people is erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, its history, then have somebody write new books, manufacture a new culture, invent a new history. Before long, that nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. The struggle of man against power is a struggle of memory against forgetting. Not that the Anglo-Saxon myth is an identity which is literally created contrary to history. Taking away a people's history, roots, culture, and denying genetic heritage is ethnocide. Each day I'm confronted with some new historic fallacy put forth by modern academia aimed at erasing traditional history in favour of pushing a fabricated woke ideology. Politically motivated anti-white universities. No surprise given it's communist Cambridge. If you want to destroy a nation, it's culture, erase its history. But why would Cambridge want to do that? Hashtag Marxists. And if we go on the conservative subreddit, they posted this article as well. Erase from history. It isn't ignorance. It is activism. This is pure Orwell. Book burnings will soon follow. Uh, how much you want to bet this guy supports Ron DeSantis? Book bannings are okay. I guess it's just burning them is the bad one. We agree. You were all fired. Anyone want a job proving Anglo-Saxons existed? And now what do I say to my ex who's Mexican-American who always pointed out, you are an Anglo. What do you have to complain about? Well, you're not an Anglo-Saxon, are you? <laughs> like you're not an American Anglo-Saxon who traces his lineage back to Alfred the Great. History is not written by the victors. History is written by the writers. And then they posted this article again. This one got more traction. Academians trying to justify their existence by problematizing everything, giving them endless opportunities to write papers no one reads and goes to useless conferences. What a shitty anti-white pseudo-anthropology. Anglo-Saxons were the people who repelled the Norse invasion and then got conquered by the Normans. Now after nearly a millennia of Anglo-Norman rule, I'd say they don't exist. And instead you have the modern English people. 
the whole thing sounds like justification for exterminating the English identity, not that the Anglo-Saxons literally, I don't know, conquered and settled England. I do love how they leave that part out that, you know, the Anglo-Saxons were also conquerors themselves, not just the Norse and the Normans. Agreed, it's designed to extinguish all cultural identity from white people in the UK. The English are trying to erase their own culture and history in the name of anti-racism when it's really just anti-white racism. This is funny. All part of the agenda that Britain was built by immigrants and therefore we need unparalleled migration from Pakistan and the third world. They don't like the uncomfortable truth that Britain was built by Celtic and Germanic peoples native to Europe for millennia and that the first real influx of non-white Im immigration only begun in the 1960s. So this person is mad that um, it's part of the agenda that Britain was built by immigrants before going on to say that uh, Germanic peoples were native to Europe. Germanic peoples were not native to Britain though, were they? The Anglo-Saxons were not British natives. So they were immigrants. They were conquerors and immigrants. So in essence, the England you're simping for was in fact built by immigrants. Was built by Romans, immigrants. Was built by the Saxons, immigrants. So the conservative subreddit is very American. So I'm not really surprised. They're just totally, totally ignorant. The change was not, don't teach that these people existed. It was Anglo-Saxon as a term doesn't necessarily make too much sense. So um, let's treat it with more nuance and also talk about how this term has been racialized. So people in these comments who believe Anglo-Saxon is some sort of racial identity now understand how ridiculous it is to say that. But that's what these racists all think. Oh my God, They're, it's anti-white racism. It's anti-white racism to say that yeah, Anglo-Saxon as a term doesn't really make sense. And let's be historically accurate. Don't these guys always cry about historical accuracy when it comes to like, films and tv shows but now when someone wants to be more historically accurate and not buy into a mythicized version of history apparently they're anti-white racist now so like i said i have done a history degree and we did do anglo-saxon england um but it wasn't like my specialist topic i didn't do loads about it i'd say like american politics was my specialist topic and like foreign policy in like the cold war and stuff but um, on Ask Historians, there was a post about this saying, do you agree with the recent statement from Cambridge that Anglo-Saxons did not exist as a distinct ethnic group? And just uh, a response by someone I found interesting. So J-Force, the Telegraph article is lazy. It misrepresents the state of academic research into early English identity by downplaying recent research, ignores tons of evidence and scholarship, and has no real interest in learning. Angles and Saxons did not form a distinct ethnic group for the vast majority of their shared history in Britain, and contemporary sources suggest that Anglo-Saxon identity had next to nothing to do with ancestry or ethnicity. That makes it somewhat irritating for academics that everything from Wikipedia to apparently every British newspaper still labels them as a coherent ethnic group to the point where academics feel the need to use Anglo-Saxon in their books just to be comprehensible to the public. The idea that Anglo-Saxon is an anachoristic falsehood as an ethnic label is not especially contentious within English academia and hasn't been for a while. As far back as the 70s, you can find academic articles that will split them into the Angles and Saxons and treat them as separate groups, using Anglo-Saxon primarily as a collective shorthand. What Cambridge staff have stated is, within academia, a well-grounded and long-established view that, while not totally dominant within academia, is popular opinion based on sound evidence. While some academics do write of an Anglo-Saxon identity, they often do so with qualified language and nuance, and it must be recognised that such identity was probably an intellectual construct, not so much a practice belief by the general population. So this bit is interesting and not something I spoke about. Um, it's quite long, but I think it's enlightening. So if we jump ahead a bit to the reign of King Athelstan in the 920s to 939, he's still trying to create a shared identity among his peoples, Moreover, the differences between Angles and Saxons seem to be a sticking point. The big issue, one that would take wars to resolve, was that many Angles in the 920s were under Danish rule. They were being influenced culturally and politically by the Norse. And like Alfred, Athelstan used the construct of a shared identity to legitimise conquest. If he called himself the King of the Saxons, then the Danes could tell him he had no business attacking Anglian lands. But if he were to call himself something like the most glorious king of the Anglo-Saxons and Danes, then he can conquer who he likes and claim to be liberating his people. So that's exactly what he did. And when he wanted to stamp his rule over Northumbria and Scotland, he called himself 
king of the Anglo-Saxons and the emperor of Northumbrians, governor of pagans and defender of the Britons. His use of titles was, na was nakedly cynical, but subtlety wasn't the point. This is where the term Anglo-Saxon came from. It's a title to legitimize conquest. To the best of my knowledge, there is no contemporary source from the hundreds of years of Angles and Saxons living in Britain where they refer to themselves as Angle Saxonum. It's something imposed on them by the political elite to legitimize their goal. In terms of genealogy, there used to be widespread belief that Angles and Saxons drove out the natives of Britannia, and in doing so were free to leave a strong, coherent genetic mark. When we look at DNA of both the modern population and what can be determined from archaeological remains, this theory is debunked and few, if any, serious historians believe it. Although there was certainly mass migration and some conflict that drove some natives away, there wasn't a replacement of the locals. Instead, there was an extensive intermingling, like I said, with them, and it wasn't just the Germanic groups getting in on the action. So to sum up, let's say we have a random dude in 8th century Essex. The literary evidence suggests that they think of themselves as Saxon, not Anglo-Saxon. There is a high chance that their ancestry is as much Gallic as it is Germanic. The term Anglo-Saxon would mean nothing to this man, so yeah, it's not wrong to say Anglo-Saxon doesn't work as an ethnic label. So great response there from someone who's clearly studied the period even more than I have, and it's something I hadn't really thought about as much, is that Angles and Saxons developed in different ways to each other. And like it was saying there, in this period, the 900s, early 900s, some Angle groups have been conquered by the Danes and lived under Dane law, where Saxons lived under Anglo-Saxon kings in like Wessex, for example. And in that, like the kings at the time would say they are the ruler of all these people to justify conquest, but it was still just like conquering these places. It was justification for doing so. So like I was saying, there was no coherent identity at the time based on ethnic makeup, but also politically, there was no coherent ideology. Like this was saying, no one at the time would call themselves Anglo-Saxon because it wouldn't make sense. It's like in modern day, maybe, me calling myself English Welsh or something because I live in England, like it wouldn't make sense. So why would I call myself Welsh as well? Like why would the Saxons call themselves the Angles as well? If they're not like one coherent group. And also we're reading about a period 900. This is before like another invasion by a Scandinavian king and then like the Norman conquest as well. Does it seem like there is a coherent Anglo-Saxon identity that somehow existed until like, I don't know, the late 1700s with the Declaration of Independence and Thomas Jefferson creating like this racialized identity or that 19th and 20th century where historiography in America and the UK pointed to an ethnic group known as the Anglo-Saxons who are actually racially superior to everyone else, including other white groups. Does it seem like it makes sense? Or does it seem like anyone who thinks Anglo-Saxon is a racial identity is themselves a massive racist and believes this to try and justify to themselves that they are better than other people based on some mythicized past? And most of these people probably couldn't even trace their lineage back to this time period anyway, or really trace their ancestry properly. Yeah, maybe some lucky few could maybe track their ancestry back to East Anglia in, uh, I don't know, 900 AD or something. But it's fair to say that a lot of white people who call themselves Anglo-Saxon in America might not even have any connection to England at all. They could be from Germany. They could be from a whole host of European countries that have nothing to do with England and English history and might not have anything to do with it at all. And also, even if you know you are generally from English descent, how would you know you're Anglo-Saxon? How would you even know you're part Anglo-Saxon? let alone like full Anglo-Saxon. Like I've said a lot of times, I know my lineage goes back to Ireland for like hundreds of years. And even I'm not sure if I'm like fully Irish going back like hundreds and hundreds of years because like, look at my hair. If you see my grandma, she looks so Mediterranean. And I've asked her like, were well, your parents immigrants or something? Or were they like from Italy? And she says, no. And I'm like, there must be down the line in my family, someone who is a Mediterranean immigrant to Ireland. So I'd never say like, I am like pure Irish like all my family forever we are Irish even though I know like some of my family names are clan names that are like pretty ancient I wouldn't suggest that, that I am just like pure Irish forever and ever till like 2,000 years ago or something because it's silly I know how history works I know Scandinavian Vikings conquered Dublin where some of my family are from as well so I could be from like Scandinavian descent as well at some point history is just like a massive melting pot in most places through conquest and through mass immigration, which you had with the Anglo-Saxons. To claim you are descended from a group of people that never existed as a coherent identity anyway. But also this relative identity stopped existing like, I don't know, a thousand years ago is absolutely ridiculous. The only thing is you buy into the racialized racist mythology from the last 100 years, which makes you think you are Anglo-Saxon. 
but you are not. Anyone who says they're Anglo-Saxon is just an idiot. But anyway, that is it for the video. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.